Hey there, my gorgeous friends on the internet. In today's episode, we're going to spend about half an hour reading this blog post about the best JavaScript frameworks for 2024. That's a joke. I'm not going to do that. That sounds boring. That sounds like the worst thing ever. I'd rather scream Wukong here on YouTube and don't even care if this is a coding channel. That's like, at least it's fun, right? Um, now, today I want to talk about... I've been going down this rabbit hole with SQL, right? The last couple of episodes have been all about that. So I've been thinking like, oh, what was the most common SQL mistakes that I did in the past? So I compiled a list together. Some of these are maybe obvious for you, but I feel like some of them are not, and it's so easy to miss out on. So let's have a look at the top SQL mistakes. Uh, drop a like if you want me to stream Wukong. Okay, let's go. For number one, this is a really common one that I see people do, is to select everything. So I have three tables here. As you can see, we have a games, posts, and users. The posts table here, if we select it, I fed around 500 records in here. So I'll do select everything from posts. Okay, and if we view this, as you can see, I have a bunch of posts and about like six or seven columns. So this is not huge, right, relative to like a real application. It's around 500 records with give or take seven or eight columns. However, if I do a select, if I do explain analyze, that's going to give me back the execution time. So if I run this, you're going to see that it hovers around like 0.1 seconds. And this is a common mistake that you just select everything and get all the data back and then you just use whatever you want. However, the more your data grows, right, and the more columns you have, this is going to get exponentially slower and slower because you're sending more data through. So it's always better to just select the parts that you need from a uh, from a table, right? So certain columns that you use. So if I go here, see, as you can see, 0 0.1, but if I go here and only select the columns that I need, so let's say I only need the title, maybe the ID, and I run this, as you can see, the execution time pretty much halves, okay? And that's just one little change that we need to do too. For number two, I want to talk a little bit about indexes. So let's say your table is quite large, and let's say we query the title here. So let's query the title. And I'm doing a where clause here where I want to make sure that the title is equal to this sample title 3000. So if I run this, as you can see, the query is relatively so slow at 0.2 seconds. So this would be a great place to add an index. Now, the mistake is don't just add indexes everywhere because when you create an index, it takes up space, right? Especially the bigger your data is, the more space it's going to take. So especially if you're hosting it on like a cloud platform, your database is like 50 gigabytes. Every index you create is going to be an extra 500 megabytes or something like that. Okay, so how can we do this? So let's say on the title here, we identified that this query is quite slow, so 0.2 seconds. So let's add a index to it. And the way you can do that is you run the command create, and we're going to say index, and then we can give it any name we want. So index title, for example, like that on the post table. And we want to make sure we add the index on the title. So let's just add that and run this query again. So if we run it, explain and analyze again, it dropped from 0 0.2 to 0 0.003 milliseconds. As you can see here, it says that it's scanned using um, the index now rather than doing a subscribe. Oh my God. For number three, let's talk about SQL injections a little bit. Now, in most cases, you might be fine not even bothering with this, especially if you're using something like Drizzle ORM. As far as I know, they handle that for you. But let me just show you a quick example so you're aware of it, okay? So an SQL injection is when a user, right, goes on your input form or whatever, and he tries to execute an SQL command there. So. Here, let's say, select title from posts where title equals, and let's say the sample title 100 here is the user input. Okay, so this equals here whatever the user input passes down. Okay, so now let's say the user input is, let's say sample title 100, right? So this is a normal Nothing malicious going on here yet, right? So it returns you that specific rope. I can hack this, okay? Let's say the user adds a sample title 100, but he does something funky like this. And then he's gonna add an or, and he's gonna say one equals one like that. So that's gonna bypass it all and just gonna return you all the rows. So you can see how, how, how this can be a potential vulnerability as 
especially if this uh, table is like a user table or something, right? You can get access to information that you're not supposed to. So as you can see now, I have access to all the all the titles from this uh, from this column. So how can we get around this? Well, what we can do is actually use a prepare statement. So we can write prepare. And I'm going to give this a name like STMT as select. And I'm going to say from, let's select everything from uh, the posts where title is equal to. And what I'm going to do here is put a placeholder. So I'm going to say dollar sign one and I'm going to hit enter. Okay. So that's just going to prepare the SQL statement for us. So what's happening here? Well, prepare S STMT here is the name that we gave it. So that's a custom name that we selected. And PostgreSQL is essentially going to compile the query template here for you. And it's going to set this uh, one here as just kind of like a placeholder for now. So now that we prepared that SQL statement, if we try to execute it with just a normal value, as you can see, it's going to work just fine. It returns us that specific row. If we try to do some weird shenanigans like this again, execute STMT and let's say this value that gets passed down is going to be sample title one, right? And then you have your or symbol here or one equals one. This is not going to work anymore because we are expected one parameter here and that is not going to work. So there we go. It stops you from doing that. For number four, let's talk about denormalized table design. So I just create a new table here, create table orders with four columns. As you can see, I have order ID, customer name and customer address and order total. Now, do you see any mistakes here? I'll pause it for a second. Three, two, one, time's up, mother. So one problem that I see straight away is that we're storing the customer name and the customer address inside these orders. Now, what's bad about that? We're storing redundant information because for every order, we're going to have the same address, right? And the same name. And especially if you want to update that specific user's address, you're going to need to go through all of those orders and modify uh, the values in here. Another thing that would be tricky is how would you create a new customer here uh, without you know creating an order here with some dummy data for that specific customer. So it gets a bit complicated. And that's the wonderful thing about SQL is that it's relational. So we can take these concepts and break it down into smaller tables uh, to keep data integrity, improve the data integrity, and also reduce redundancy. So how would we modify this? Well, one thing we can do is create two separate tables. So I'll create a normalized customer table, which is only going to hold the customer ID, the name and the address. All right. So let's add that. And next up for the orders, we can just create a foreign key to reference that. So create table orders and I'm just passing in the customer ID as a reference there. So let's hit enter. And now let's just insert some data. So I'm going to add two customers here like that. And I'm also going to insert two orders just like this. So now we have control over this. We don't need to just query that one table and then figure it out from there. We can use joins, inner joins, outer joins uh, to get that data back the way we want to. So now if we run this command, select order ID, customer name, customer address, and here, as you can see, we're doing a join on the customers. So when we run this, as you can see, when I have two John Doe's here, this is only stored once in one location rather than creating duplicate data. For the next one, I've seen this a couple of times where people assume that null in SQL is like in JavaScript or something like zero or like an empty string, which is not the case. And your query might look completely different uh, based on your understanding of null. So let me show you a quick example. So we have the customers here uh, and the orders. So let's say I want to insert a new order here. So I'll do something like this. I'll say insert into orders of the customer ID and the order total, and I'm going to pass the order total in as null. Okay, so let's add this. So now let's say we want to make a query that just returns all the orders that have the total as null. So if you run something like this, select everything from orders where order total equals to null, you might be like, okay, it's going to return that. But that's not the case. As you can see, we're getting back zero rows. So in this case, null here represents an unknown or a missing value. So if you do want to check specifically for null, what you want to do, let's go back here. Rather than using equals to null here, there's a special SQL command that you can run is is 
no like that <laughs> and hit enter and there you go as you can see now we are getting back that correct record also do note when you're running an aggregate so let's say we're doing an average here of totals this is gonna ignore all the null values this one's a really easy one and a bit me in the ass once and i never want it to happen whenever you use update or delete please please don't forget your where clause because it's gonna update everything and then you're gonna have a really bad time uh, trying to revert the changes so let's say i don't know let's do the user right so let's select everything from the users table sorry from the users right okay so we got three here we got just try coding traversy media and develop by it okay so let's say we want to update traversy media's email so we'll do update table we want to update as the users and we want to set what the email so you might write something like this your email over to traversy at gmail this time and you hit enter and you're like what update three what you mean three it should have been updating one that's because we forgot the where clause so now it just updated all of our email records over to traversy media's um, gmail so so the correct way to do it would be to update the users table and then we can set the email over to let's just do test at gmail right but here We'll also need to add the where clause where it matches something, right? Where email or whatever the ID, let's say the ID that's probably better equals two traverses, which is two. So if we hit enter now, it's only updated one. So if we select this again, you're gonna see that's the only only column that got updated. Okay, so very, very easy to, it's not even about not knowing about this. It's sometimes you might forget to add it and then you're like, oh crap. For the next one is just being aware of transactions. Sometimes I see this throughout code bases where they just make queries one after the other. But the problem is that one of the queries is very dependent on the next one. So to give you an example, let's say you have a shop website, right? So when you buy a product, you might run a query to update the order and to create an order, but you might also want to update something on the user. Okay, so you might have like two queries that are dependent on each other. So imagine that the, uh, the first query where it creates the order doesn't go through. Well, that that means that we, we don't want to do the second query, right? Because that one failed. So we want to actually roll back and just cancel it out and throw an error, right? So that's the whole idea with a transaction. It's queries that rely on each other. We want them to be executed in a certain way. And if all goes through, then it's all good. If one fails, it's gonna roll back for you. Okay, so just to set up a simple example, that's probably a common one with like a uh, shop. Uh, but let's say we wanna transfer likes over from, from one post to another. So I just drop the table here and I'll just create a new one. So let's create a new table here called posts. All right, and the thing I want you to focus on is that it has a like here, right? And it's set to zero for now. So let's create that table and I'll just insert two here. So I'll insert two. As you can see, we have post A and post B. Now post A has 50 likes, post B has 30 likes, okay? So let's create these two. As you can see, it's been successfully inserted. So a dangerous way to do this would be to run it like this, update posts, set likes, and then we'll say minus 10 where the title is post A. So we'd run that first and then we'd run the other one, which is set the likes on the post B to plus 10. Okay, but imagine if something goes wrong, if the first one doesn't go through, then we have problem here because the second one did get transferred and it get, did get the likes, whereas the first one didn't. So to do this, it's as simple as adding the begin keyword running the, the queries that you want to run. So we'll run the post A and the post B and then simply adding the commit tag at the end. So if we execute this, look at that, the commit began, it updated those two. So if we do a select now on the posts, that correctly updated. There we go, lovely. Now, if you're enjoying these bite-sized lessons, well, then you're gonna wanna hear about today's sponsor, Brilliant. I use Brilliant because it's a fantastic platform to learn new concepts by doing. They offer these interactive lessons in math, data analysis, programming, and even AI. It really is such an effective way to learn. Their hands-on approach lets you play with the concepts, which has proven to be six times more effective than passive learning. Plus, you're not just like memorizing stuff, you're actually building real problem-solving skills than applying it to any programming language. 
I highly recommend checking out courses like Thinking in Code and Programming with Python, which are a perfect way to build up a strong foundation. I personally love just every time I have five minutes of downtime, just open up the app, find the subject that I'm not familiar with, and then do in a couple of interactive lessons there. So to try everything Brilliant has to offer, you'll get a full 30 days for free if you visit brilliant.org slash develop by ad, or if you click the link in the description, you'll also get a 20% off your annual premium subscription. So thank you so much. Let me show you a less common mistake where using the where clause can turn a left join into an inner join. So I'll create a table here called customers. It's just gonna have an ID name and an address on it. So let's create that table. And I'm gonna insert three uh, customers here. Okay, so John Doe, John Smith, and Emily Clark. So let's do that. There we go. And let's also create an orders table now. So this orders table is gonna hold a reference to that customer ID. Okay, so let's create that. Okay. Now let's also insert three orders here. So we're gonna do these three like that and hit enter. Now check this out. If I do a left join here on the orders, I'm gonna get back John Doe, John Doe and John Jane Smith, but I'm not getting back Emily here. And that's because of this where clause here. Even though I did a left join and it should return me all of them, even the ones with null, it does not because of this where clause. So to fix this issue, we can run the same command, but at the where clause, we'll also have to include a is, uh, is null or not. So here, if we add an or, we can do o the order total is null. And that, that's when it's gonna act properly like a left join. So let's hit enter. And as you can see, we're getting back M Emily Clark as well now with the null value. So be careful, even though you're doing the left join, sometimes if you're working with null values, it might still be some funky business. For number nine is being aware how where clauses work with aggregate functions. So let me set up a quick example here. Let's say we have, again, we have that customers. So I'll just create it again. I drop the table, so it's gonna look the same. And I'm just gonna add the same customers here, but we're gonna create more orders. So we'll have John Doe, Jane Smith, and Emily Clark. So let's add those three. We're gonna create our orders again with that foreign key on the customer ID. But now I'm gonna add a couple more in here. So let's do one, two, three, four, five of them. Okay, and let's say we wanna calculate like all of our customers that have exceeded a total of more than $500. So you might do something like this. You're gonna say select C as customer name, and you're gonna do a sum of the to order totals here. And then we're gonna rename it to total spent. So we're gonna select that from the customers. We're gonna join in the orders here. And then we're gonna add a where clause here with the sum of the order totals uh, that's bigger than 500. And then we're gonna group it as customer name here. So if we try to run that, that is not gonna work. That's, as you can see, aggregate functions are not allowed in where. So to correctly filter the group of this aggregate function, you can use the keyword having, and that's gonna execute after. So this is how we can do that. So rather than adding the where clause there, we can add a group by here of C customer name, and then we can just pass down the having keyword here as a sum of the order totals that are bigger than 500. And if we hit enter now, as you can see, we get that correct list back with the renamed column. And mistake number 10 is gonna be using MongoDB. So thank you so much for watching this episode. Hopefully you enjoyed it. And yeah, I'll catch you guys in the next one. You know what to do. Do the likes, do the subs. Peace out.